It's a pleasure for me to be here and um, to make my experience on the difficult double. Okay, so that's me. I'm Emmanuel Christ, born 1970. I have an office, as Kirsten was mentioning, in Basel together with Christoph Gantenbein, who was born one year after I was born. And in the meantime, there is an office uh, with around 45 people working on different projects. I'm also teaching. So that's the most natural start to what we're doing here. But then there is another um, guy. This is Hans Pölzig. He was born in 1869, so 101 years before I was born. So you could say, actually, and Adolf Loos, huh, just to give you an idea, was born in nine, 1870. So it's the same generation as we are, but just 100 years earlier. Anyway, so that's Hans Pölzig. Um, the turn of the century and the turn of the millennium. Who knows? Huh? There are perhaps there are some parallels. Um, he was brought up in Berlin, then he went to Breslau, that is Poland today, um, where he had a very um, productive first and early period. Then he was appointed as the city architect of the city of Dresden. Perhaps in this period he did the most crazy projects, but it was not that productive. It was during World War I. And after the Dresden period, he moved on then to Berlin, where, where he um, actually continued his, his uh, quite um, astonishing career. He was an architect, of course, but also a teacher. And I understand from, this, from the books, from, from the stories that are told, that he must have been a, an amazing master, a teacher, and with, with uh, his whole engagement. And, um, and that's not enough. He also was an artist, and he also considered himself as an architect, being an artist, but he also painted. So um, this is already quite something. This is Pelzi. Um, uh, my sort of counterpart tonight, so um, it's not so easy. I know about the, the let's say, the tricky, the tricky aspect of the whole thing. Hmm? Pelzi. So, huh? That's actually one of his um, unbuilt designs for the City Hall of Dresden, 1916. He is very well known as the, the architect of expressionism, of German expressionism at the time. And um, so, but why would Pölzig be my counterpart for tonight? I mean, this is uh, <laughs> the question that we will have to deal with for, for the coming uh, couple of minutes. I was, of course, then thinking about that. And um, I thought, because I did my diploma project um, in an almost pulsic like uh, manner, perhaps. Um, but how would you know that? I mean, uh, ha, ha, ha. So um, <laughs> is this, <laughs> is this pulsic? I don't know. Oh, no, it's my diploma project 1997 or 98. Mm. Yeah, I had a teacher. He was not pulsic, uh, but he might he might be influenced, or at the time, might have been influenced by Pölzig. This was Hans Kolhoff at, at ETH in Zurich. But what is interesting and, 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 and now more relevant for, for the talk and the discourse tonight, I mean, Pölzig is and has always been important to me and to us also in the discussions for Christopher and myself. Although he is not, he is not easy to understand. Huh? It's a very, very um, singular and, and unique position in architecture. So, but his work is definitely worth it to be looked at again and again also nowadays and therefore I'm very grateful and I want to thank you again for this, um, for this um, encounter in the difficult double um, and actually I tried to make out of this difficult double a wonderful difficult hole if possible so this is a bit ambitious and let's see how we can proceed into that so let me introduce a series of um, topics or keywords that I consider characteristic for Pelzig's work and also for some extent, to some extent to our own work. So it is a sort of a very loose theoretical um, structure that shall guide us through the um, next hour 
exploring the work of Pelzig and, and kind of echoing this work through our own um, architectural production that is the one we're doing in the office. All right, nostalgia, image, perspective and depiction, cave space, autonomy of form, which leads to the freedom of the architect, the building as a sculptural body, monumentalization through simplification and repetition, and symmetry. Well, I don't know whether this is coherent, huh? it's just a series of words. And this is our very first project that we built, Christian Gantenbein project, that we, we built um, in, um, I think finished around the year 2000. It stands on a railway track. Mm -hmm. And it looks a little bit like uh, a little factory that you would find typically all along the Swiss railway network. So it is a project that is very clearly inspired by the everyday anonymous architecture of a, let's say, pragmatic modernism of the second half of the 20th century. And these images, these buildings were very important to us when we were designing this first project. So what we did is by following the railway tracks, by taking pictures, we were creating our own system of reference <coughs> that was leading us into this um, design. So the design literally started almost with the facade, with the exploration of a facade. That's the drawings. There are some kind of accidental things like a stairs or a railing, things happening in a rather casual manner. And at the same time, we had this very simple stratification of the two floors and a sockle underneath. So these were the drawings somehow directly inspired by the experience of this, let's say, informal uh, architectural history that was like present in our, in our research. And that's how the building looks like. It's grey as the whole, as the whole um, world along the railway track is. So grey actually became something like a leading, um, uh, a leading topic in our work. It's actually about creating a place and its atmosphere. Huh? The almost invisible project. Is there authorship? Is, is, there, is there design? There is, of course. This is the plan. Huh? A sort of an accidental composition again. There is an overlapping part where the core is, but it's slightly shifted. We don't know really why. You might see that there is a structure of of um, columns, so it's a, it's a domino, typical modern domino system that then also allows for this sort of space that is almost a quotation, you could say, you know, the 1960s, the office building, places we actually experienced, huh? like our studio or the, the flat um, one of us rented at the time, and it was the first move into this world through the approach of an image, and you could call that, I mean, uh, a sort of nostalgia. Uh, we were perhaps nostalgic of a, of a world that was lost, that we considered not present anymore. The, the old times were just simple production was full of quality. Uh, that was like a little bit the naive, the, the naive um, dream. And I think it is not so untypical for a young architect. Uh, you don't have your own vocabulary yet. You look at examples. You, you try to learn your first lessons in just testing what's around you. And therefore, um, I think this is an ex a very important experience. And um, actually, of course, this was not so different um, for the young Pölzig. Uh, there was also a sort of nostalgia, uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, he was convinced that technology is to be accepted, but somehow the real culture of architecture lies in their craftsmanship. Uh, and he looked up th somehow through his teachers to, to the period of the Gothic cathedrals of the Middle Ages um, uh, in, in Germany. And what's interesting, I mean, this is like a caricature of a, it's an early project by Pölzig. Uh, 
1904. And what you can read already from that roof uh, is it expresses an idea of protection, of home, and one could start to speculate about the expressionist potential in such a work, a form that goes beyond the function, that is understood as something that is independent to a certain extent. Huh? So, a sort of nostalgia, working with the image. There is a, a second project of his early period for a monument uh, for Bismarck, Bismarck Denkmal. It's a, the second version. It's a stadium inside. And what is interesting, it is a sort of a celebration of the massive wall. It's the brickwork, it's the massivity. And this is already in the time where steel construction is all over the place, where all sorts of modern technology is taken over. Pölzig still dreams of such an architecture that is everlasting and extremely beautiful, I have to say. And it goes on. There is a water tank, a water tower, 1910, for Hamburg. He actually writes at this very moment a text where he talks about the opportunities of modern technology. So he is very open in his text. Uh, he writes about steel constructions and, 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 and all these kind of light materials. And at the same time, he draws these sort of beautiful drawings uh, of the massive wall with these semicircle um, punched holes. That's a, an element that is again and again to be found in his project with the arches. So again, that tower, second version, and finally the third one. Never, never been built, I think, in that form. Um, dramatic. It looks like, looks like a sort of a church. And then it goes on. Another, another tower, another, let's say, almost industrial or pseudo-industrial construction. That's 1911 on the Industrieausstellung in, um, in uh, Poznan where he proposes this construction. And what I find interesting, actually, on the top here is a restaurant during the exhibition. And after that, it is, it is um, planned to be trans, um, transformed into a water tank. So it is a sort of a hybrid thing that is a public building that turns into an infrastructure element. And you see, of course, the strength of that form, which makes me again think of nostalgic images in the sense that you're thinking of cathedrals, of towers in the medieval city. There is something that goes clearly beyond functionality. There is, was an alternative scheme by Mark Stout that was just, you know, the very skinny, the very skinny concrete skeleton. And this is Pölzig, steel construction this time. So he accepts, starts to accept to a certain extent that there is a different way of building. Yeah? But the interest lies in the image. How do I express this new construction? How can I relate this new reality somehow to the tradition of craftsmanship? And when I'm telling this, uh, I'm aware of the fact that I'm telling also a little bit of a theory or a narrative about our own work. Please, we try to not confuse too much uh, the two things. Christen Gantenbein is the modest contemporary operation, and there's Pölzig. But it's interesting somehow to weave into each other these uh, two narratives. And I promise you, it will be completely blurred in the end. So that's the experiment. And forgive me if it's not necessarily a success. So the image. Huh? The image, actually, there were also images, paintings inside this water tower, which is also quite strange, you know, that you decorate again. Uh, somehow he doesn't feel comfortable yet with the, just the pure, sheer um, modern construction of that times. But it's kind of hallucinating to see that, you know, from the top then, the exhibition hall and these wonderful stairs that um, lead up to the, to the platform and then the entrance that again uh, uses brickwork in a very decorative way, which I think is very interesting since very often nowadays we still dream of bricks. We all know we cannot use bricks as they were used. Uh, massive wall doesn't exist, so we glue bricks somehow to a sort of a structure. He started to experiment with that in a, in a quite interesting way. He actually did that in a big scale project which is also a very famous, I, I wouldn't say famous, I don't know, is there anyone in here who does know the work of Hans Pölzig? Not really, Hans, a little bit. Huh? So um, I, 
just hope that I'm not repeating just your history classes um, on, on these examples, but uh, I think it's really interesting. This is a chemical factory in Luban, also east of, of Dresden. This is brick. Huh? And what is interesting, you see two types of walls. Huh? You see the one with the arches and the punched holes arch. So one type, one wall is authentic, is massive, the one with the arches. And the other one is what is called in German a Prussverband. I don't know how you, Pruss sort of structure. That's this one, huh? where you have a structure behind in steel and it's just a sort of a skin in, 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 um, in light bricks that are, that are just attached to the frame, to the frame of steel. Huh? So that's a completely different a sort of a textile, almost simple-like understanding of the brick wall. So besides being a factory, it is, this project is a beautiful example of an experiment, of a research in designing a brick wall. Huh? with its dip different openings. The openings are far too small, you could say. There is no light going in. But it's interesting to see how they give a rhythm and, and a sort of a, of a texture, almost like a text on the facade that, of course, is also an operation to even increase the monumentality of the building because the, I think, from my reading of the photograph, I've never been there, and I still is Actually, I think it still exists, but um, I, d I never managed to see it. The windows are really small, so the monumentality, the scale of the building is even increased by this effect. And that's another observation that I just like to add on to this um, discussion of that project. And it's one of my, it's maybe the third aspect uh, of, of, my, of my series of, of um, key notions. It's perspective, I'm obviously every architect is dealing with perspective in the moment when we produce our images and our designs, but also then by how we arrange perhaps a building and how we are composing it. And then the depiction, and depicting means how I represent it, can again be very crucial, I think, to the, to the design decisions. And I think in this case, Pölzig was very, very aware of how the effect of the perspective, how the experience in the space translated into the image is at stake here. So this is not just a common industrial building. Huh? It is like a monument of an early expressionist kind of experiment in architecture. And you see this kind of stepping down volume, the tower, and then this factory building that kind of um, how is this? Oh, no, I think it's correct. <laughs> How it kind of expands into the, into the horizontal uh, with this stepping down element of the roof, which of course gives a very strong staccato to the perspective. And then there is a second building, which is amazing because there is this um, pignon, the stepped um, Stufengiebel. I, I don't find the word, excuse me. Right, the Stufengiebel, actually a very German medieval um, motif. Right? which is like glued to this industrial hall. One is very vertical, authentic wall. The other one is quite horizontal and it sort of almost falls apart. So when I'm talking about, again, images huh, and the montage of, of a perspective in the image, I think this element shows that very strongly. And I'm fascinated by that moment of composing an image in your architecture. Uh, so this is the chemical factory in, in Luban. And please forgive me the rather superficial um, linking back into um, na <laughs> our times. Looking at a very small industrial site in Switzerland, this is a project that is now under completion. We're so we're still finishing it. On the right, you see this kind of eventail, the fan. This opens up like this. It's a sort of a shed structure, strangely opening towards the space, so moments of perspective and distortion of space and perspective is, um, you could say, at stake here as well. It is um, a customer center for a, a high-tech um, company producing machinery for polymer treatment, so a typical Swiss niche um, technology-based um, company 
and they need a, it's not big, you know, but they have a global client, so from everywhere, and they're the countryside outside Basel somewhere. So what they need, or what they were looking for, is a building where you can um, uh, host your your clients, so your customers. It's a sort of a marketing thing. You can have meetings, and where you also can test new new um, technology so it's a sort of a pilot center slash marketing customer place so, so where where technology specifically in these three bays they would have machinery were highly installed meet with let's say the client or the people discussing engineers but also people who make business in different in different environments of office and meeting rooms etc so it's a sort of a mise en scène of an encounter of two things, the industry on the one hand, and let's say the human being on the other. Uh, that's the, the main floor. The whole thing is a bit in, on a slope, so there is a basement where you then see the control spaces and the laboratories. Actually very tiny. Uh, and this is, um, this is the section. So also in a way a struggling how to express the image, the imagery of industry in, in a project that is not just purely functional. Uh, there is a need for architecture because that was the brief of the client. I want to communicate something. Uh. I'm industrial, but I'm not as everyone else. So how can we possibly express that in a, in a building, in a space? Uh. So that's the elevations. The name of the company is List. Uh. So it's, again, uh, the kind of casual grey world of 1960s architecture, slightly tilted and distorted. <coughs> and this is just a few, a few shots, so that's not really finished, but you get an idea about, about um, the perspective, so to say. It's um, just raw aluminum which is in a way nice, huh? it's just also the windows and it changes strangely the scale and the character to the different sides so it's a sort of um, a manuristic, manuristic shed hole a difficult hole within one project uh, as it is described by Venturi perhaps it's not completely finished, you see that's the entrance then so where then the letters will be just kind of polished in the, in the, in the panels of the, of the facade and the inside is this um, combination of the solid volumes for, for the machinery and the open space of the, let's say, studio-like space inside. All right, whether we want to relate that to Peltzig or not, I go back to the beautiful image that is also on the poster. Großes Schauspielhaus Theater in, in Berlin, 1919. So actually that's said uh, in the books and in history, the first and perhaps only built expressionist work by Pölzig. Uh, that's, let's say, the most famous period. It's a crazy project, it's fantastic. Berlin, 19. Uh, so Max Reinhardt was the great innovator, the avant-garde of the, of the theatre world. He actually found a circus, an existing circus in Berlin, that was before a market hall transformed into a circus and he had, he had the possibility, I don't remember the play, but doesn't matter, Antigone or something, to play that in this circus, existing circus, the manège and all this. So that was completely different from the experience of the theater and it was like a discovery to him, to Reinhardt, that he that he's, um, experienced this stage that is surrounded by, by the audience. So what he then wanted to do is actually he he bought the circus and he asked Pölzig to transform it into a theatre, in a great grand theatre, following the idea of the circus to a certain extent. No? Already there. So this is the stage extended in different portions into the audience and all that is then newly built. No? In section you see the intention of a kind of a quarter or half a dome and then a dome that is recalling this, uh, this, um, this uh, circus that was already there. So it was a work of 
rearranging and decorating basically this space. Huh? And you might know this image, this is the inside. It's all plaster work. It's hanging from the ceiling. And what is funny, huh? and now I'm approaching my next, um, my next topic, um, the dramatic space. It's a space for drama and uh, the cave space. Huh? It is a cave. It is a cave. Pölzig <coughs> apparently argued that these sort of um, um, stalactites, or I don't know how you call that, they are there for acoustical reasons. Uh, perhaps it's true, uh, it's <laughs> because the dome, the pre exhibit was not so good for acoustics, but of course there is more than just acoustics. Uh, and, um, <coughs> and it's just crazy that it's lit indirectly, as you can see, so there is light and there is this rhythm of this surface which creates this kind of miraculous magical space that is like a cave. Uh, and Cave space, uh, it's an invention, I don't know, cave space, it's not even a, a proper term, but I like it uh, because it is this kind of archaic understanding of a space, actually created here in Berlin with rather simple means. Uh, and, you <laughs> and then it gets a bit cheesy, I would say, uh, when it gets really kind of soft edge, it's like Baba Baba House. Uh, but that was in all the foyers, uh, but it's amazing, look at these pictures. Uh, and it's enormous the light that falls in and then all the soft edge. So I don't know whether you associate that with the idea of a theater, but it was sort of solemn. And then the beautiful columns, light columns. So Pölzig, he was really independent in terms of language. I mean, 1919, was already there was an avant-garde that then into, into the 1920s and onwards created the Bauhaus, etc. You know, <laughs> international style, Bauhaus style. Pölzig was a complete freak. He was working on his own ideas and each project he had a different approach. And this also to be said, he was a master, as I said, so a very strong and influential teacher, but he had no style. Huh? He was not like others, like Tesseno or so, with his moral of giving the right, the right language. And, and I find, personally, I find that amazing, this project, and at the same time very hard to understand. But one wishes that one could see it, and then of course, I wanted, sorry, I wanted just to relate this picture to the drawing, because I said he was a an artistic architect and the drawing, the gesture of the hand, just the line on the paper is very directly related to his um, way of creating, creating a space and an architecture. And then unfortunately in the 1980s only this complex of the theatre got destroyed. And that I don't know actually why, I think it was 85 or so, and perhaps it was too expensive to hold it or whatever, but it was relatively late. I was uh, and it was in e Eastern Berlin then uh, at the time, so they there. Uh, <coughs> cave space, uh, that's another cave space. <laughs> Let's try. We saw a demolition, this is a construction, uh, it's not the same, but um, at least it's rough too. And this is um, some images of the National Museum we're doing right now. So I don't explain the whole project in length, I just give you uh, uh, some insight into a space or a series of spaces that will become a turn into a museum. And what I find interesting about that, talking images, it could remind us of a technical infrastructure, something like a dam in the mountains or a power plant where you create, where you gain uh, electrical power from water or something. So it is a bit scary too. Huh? It is using a vocabulary. Actually, this is rough concrete. That's how it will remain. Huh? This floor will be polished and here we have um, ventilation elements and, and smoke um, extraction and things. Of course there is formal spatial intention behind that. The object stands as a sort of a bunker lifted up in the middle. You can not really, in the context of a historicist sort of castle that is the old National Museum that uh, exists since 100 years or more than 100 years in, right next to the, to the main station in Zurich. So the extension actually is like sort of closing an open C shape into an O. So you have a kind of a circular um, promenade architectural that connects the old and the new part. And there is a very kind of a almost expressionist gesture of a, of a body that is breaking the roof shape. And 
through that trying to sort of make allusion to the plasticity of the existing volumes, knowing of course that the existing is full of stylish elements in terms of architectural style, I'm, I'm saying so. There's Baroque-like elements, there's Gothic style, and this is a rather abstract kind of rough, untreated um, piece of stone-like um, element, which is that construction. It's a tube huh, out of concrete. So basically what one sees from the outside is the space that we get in the inside. That is at some points quite spectacular and dramatic if you want. Or there is the huge stairs that are connecting the different levels and opening a sort of a big bridge opening to the, to the park. Is this expressionist? I don't know. Is it related to the idea of a, let's say, yeah, plastical space? This is actually in the existing part that is also completely refurbished and where we put just the light and the new ceilings because everything has to be reinforced against earthquake, etc. So, but that's more the technical aspect. It gives us the opportunity to also kind of rework the whole existing building and to in a, in a, we think, subtle but also quite visible way to reinterpret the architecture that was there of this historicist period by Gustav Gull. So it is also um, a, an experience in rewriting the history of that building and to give it a bit more physical strength and presence than it actually had perhaps in, in the old days. And this is the main hall of the existing. So somehow the cave space, huh, the, the, the sort of caverne on the one hand and this hall on the other are like creating uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, ensemble, I think. All right, I move on compared to Pölzig's drawings. This is all very modest. This is uh, for Salzburg Festspielhaus. So um, in that time, he was w early, early, tw um, yeah, early 20s. He was working um, for a project that wasn't built in the outskirts of Salzburg. And what's interesting, it's perhaps his most generous project, uh, where, he, where he got, in a way, really Baroque. And this is interesting, because Salzburg, as we know, Fischer von Erlach and others, there is a strong presence of Baroque. And Pölzig, and this makes me thinking of the role of context. Uh, to what extent is context important to an architect like Pölzig? Salzburg was inspiring him as a cultural landscape, the Baroque tradition, the castles and, and, and their gardens, but also then in his sketches the landscape um, was, was um, influencing his design. So I would argue, and this is for sure um, true for, for our own interest and, and, and me method also, that the context matters, as it has been said um, in San Rocco actually at some point, context. <laughs> so. Pölzig and context, it's an interesting question, I, I cannot really answer it, but in the sketches for Salzburg you can find this direct link, uh, it's very rare in the material I could see. Uh, another beautiful sketch. And then actually he also did um, proposals not only for the buildings, but also for the, for the stage. Uh, so that's for, I think, let me see, this is a, yeah, this is a study for Don Giovanni by Mozart, huh? so on the stage, kind of a Bühnenbild. Huh? And also this one is for Don Giovanni, so he did his paintings, and this is, um, I think, King Lear by Shakespeare, so a complete different language. I actually have to say I almost prefer this one to the Don Giovanni. And then very famous, and I just show that to show you the freedom, you know, and the capacity of, of tackle whatever subject. This is a film set for the Golem wie in die Welt kam. Huh? It is a, it's a famous movie and um, he did actually interiors and the streets, kind of the medieval, again, now we're back in his kind of utopian and nostalgic fantasies. Um, he also did the, the poster, etc. So 
again another interior for an audience of a theater you would say it's almost a sort of a baroque or rococo um, style <laughs> and energy in these at, at that period in his drawings and um, of course here at that point I feel a bit more um, distant it's to to the to the research of of Pelzig but what is interesting is this huge variety um, of of designs so different assignments and the forms and what you can observe by looking at these at, at these um, drawings is um, is of course that at the core of the interest is the form itself it's an exploration in form and the form or more precisely the most powerful the form with the strongest possible expression is at the aim of, of his of his work and I think this is this is of course a central a central point to architecture <laughs> as such and especially when we are talking about Pölzig that every single line on the paper is creating is discovering a new form uh, and it's about the predominance of form over the function and the program I think that's what at least what I I would claim here and what then leads to this very simple um, theoretical consequence is that at that point when the form is so strong and so independent from the constraints of function and and other and other factors then the creator the architect becomes the freedom gets the freedom to to control the design and to to a certain extent um, dominate dominate the scene through through his design work so you could say the autonomy of form leads to the freedom of the architect to decide on it and to develop it by himself and through that also to to gain his aut um, authority as as a designer mm. and therefore I think this is a very central a very central um, uh, aspect of <laughs> of the discussion in our profession and this is of course very valuable today uh, how do we defend our authority through through the formal work itself I mean you're, you're dealing <laughs> with, with the laboratory of ar architecture as for architecture as form so you know better than I do but I think this is one discovery that makes it really interesting to look at Pölzig because he was <coughs> he was kind of cool enough you know not as like all the modernists and the Bauhaus people who always came up with all the excuses you know it has to look like that because it's cheap because it's fast because it's so handy to have it I mean Mutesius, another guy who was in ve uh, very much um, influenced by the comfortable uh, English life uh, at the turn of, this, of the century, came back. Was very influential then in, in, in Germany. He came back. He came back to, to Germany, built beautiful houses, traditional in a way, but also modern. Huh? And um, there was a, there, there was a, an interest for form and a care about form. And then when in the in the 1920s and then Weissenhof 27. <coughs> Mutesius, I just read that, you know, when I was uh, kind of ob obsessed with these things. Um, Mutesius said it's like a new, new Jugendstil, uh, Weissenhof. So it is, of course, it is style, it's aesthetics as well. But Pölzig, he just said, that's the form, uh, that's the expression of a building, and I take care of that. And he was quite successful in doing so. So that, therefore, I'm looking up to him um, very much anyways. So... Um, I said he approached every project from scratch, no pre-cooked solutions and that's quite surprising. I mean this may be one of the most ugly objects I know, uh, but it's very personal. It's the Majolica Chapel, 1921, completely surreal in a way, uh, completely surreal. I remember that image, I only know this image, I don't know whether it was built, perhaps not. It's his expressionist period and of course it's obviously I don't know, it's a sort of a strange object. But I have to say, and that's maybe the most tricky part of this lecture now, because even therefore I could now kind of just um, get something out of my pocket that would even match this sort of adventure, you know, from our own work. Yeah. Because exploring the free form, uh, fighting and struggling for the autonomy of form and space <laughs> is something we had our, our adventures too. Um, this is actually, it's a, I would say it's a sculpture. It's not necessarily architecture. It's, it's a pavilion. 
built in China. We did that like maybe eight, ten years ago, nine years ago. No, ten years ago. Um, yeah. I don't have to comment on every image, I think. Huh? <laughs> but it's quite an impressive um, space. Uh, Autonomy of form, freedom of the architect, authority of the architect. Cave space. There is another um, project that I is a bit more recent that we did in our office. It's still a sort of a sculpture, much more simple but still very free. Yeah? And it is also freestanding. It is just a sort of a column, 30 meters high, and you look up into the sky. So there is no function. Uh, so it is a sort of a, a manifesto for a space that is not needed, and it has a soft, a soft um, sort of perimeter outline that is also stabilizing this concrete wall that stands freestanding. So the experience with the dramatic unknown space is very enriching and it's also interesting to see then how such a landmark stands in a landscape and there, I think this is um, in this respect a quite precise, a quite precise um, uh, operation. It stands in a natural reserve uh, in, in Mexico along a pilgrim's route. So it is a sort of a landmark and it's a lookout point. We were asked to do something like a lookout point to see the panorama. We thought it was more interesting to look up to the sky because the mountains and the landscape, you see them anyway. And which is interesting, temporarily it turns in this into a sort of a, a village and it's a church of the village and then you can enter it in a through a small door and you would look up through that space. So an element of architecture, a form that is quite independent of function and constraints. And this links me to the discourse I'm trying to make along this um, lecture. This is another, another mm -hmm. image looking up to this sort of folded tower tube that stands up into the sky. And this brings me also back to another formal research by Pölzig. <coughs> he did for a building with corner towers. So what is interesting to observe at some point also is to see that there is, at least for myself, this is very valuable, I don't know for Pölzig, but there's also a need for systematization, uh, working in series, types of forms, uh, to become a bit more systematic to sort of bring in a certain control, some criteria of choice into, into your design. And also to relate it to the city. I mean, this is in a very, let's say, um, dramatic way. He calls that a medieval, a medieval city in the front, and that's a proposal or a, an image for a high-rise complex uh, in the background. Mm. So still, uh, the big scale is his obsession. And also what I find interesting, and a very modern or contemporary thought, to contain different programs within one form. Again, form. Uh, how to integrate different programs. I don't know, difficult hole, but um, it's a fire station for Dresden, never built. Different, <laughs> different, um, different um, versions. So he had these vertical elements, he had the garages, he had, I think, like six or eight gates for the carriages to go through, but of course he wanted to have these arches all around. So it was this struggle huh, to integrate function and to somehow accept the, un, the um, unevitable, like the tower for the, for the pipes and the drains. So, yeah, the whole. The building as a sculptural body, uh, that's the way he worked the material, very often in clay which I think is actually something that is very interesting also to try again in the school, uh, in the studio. It's maybe different from a collage and it's very different even, but working the whole building out of the, of the clay as a, as a sculpture almost. But also this, another, oh sorry, another, another tower, I think a gas, a gas um, tank 
which is a beautiful object, I, I think never built in 1917. And then also more normal buildings, a bank building for Dresden. This is a bank building we built uh, for Liestal, which is at uh, the outskirts of Basel. Uh, the building as a sculptural object, the perspective and its depiction, uh, the contrast between a very boring, stupid rhythm of a grid and this sort of strange exception that give mass and, and um, weight, dramatic weight, monumental weight to the building. I think these are themes that we would also relate to the work of Pölzig. And um, it's interesting. This project, in my understanding, represents perhaps most this idea of a really kind of a closed entity, the building as an object, kind of hermetic object in a strange situation here in the city fabric. But there are elements. Pölzig said, Architektur braucht Masse. Architecture needs mass, weight, material. This is prefab concrete, so it's not so massive. But we had this obsession um, with the building that expresses exactly this sort of solidity and mass, although then it risks to almost fall. Uh, so the stability is also put into question, which I think is correct. And then comes another project by Pölzig, and it goes on, 1920s. So the urban scale, which I'm very fascinated with, because I think now Pölzig dreaming of these crazy music hall and things also accepts the challenge of the city with a very beautiful building. This is actually a composition, a, 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 sorry, a, a competition proposal for the Bahnhof Friedrichstraße, where Mies also in 1922 proposed this glass tower. Pölzig did this. Could also be a 1950s building. Maybe it's not the most the most exciting one, but therefore I like it very much, and it gives me also the ideal bridge to a tower project that we are finishing now. This stands also at a station, frontal building, uh, under construction. It will be cladded in a galvanized steel, three, four floors of, of commercial and office, and then 16, I think, or 17 floors of housing. Nasty building, because it has this sort of <laughs> closed, <laughs> um, there is a constraint, huh? but being amidst this kind of argument about form, I shouldn't talk about noise and all these things. Huh? It's just nice to give a building like a, like a backbone, a core that is not centred, but eccentric, which is also a bit of a challenge for the engineers. So to actually then create this sort of a shape. Huh? This is with the offices, that's the core that goes up and that's the core for the offices. So actually the size of the apartments, oh, which, oh that's, oh fuck. Um, I, I, um, this is really, I, no, no, I, I um, that is dramatic, but it doesn't matter. I, the nicest thing is the floor plan, but I, I confuse that. Okay, this is the ground floor with the two entrances to the, to the housing and to the offices and then you go up, very systematic. And then when you're up at the, uh, um, a letter, you would have five apartments that go like this, you know, just one-sided, opening to the landscape and also having the noise and the trains and everything and the, the heavy cargo trains in the back. So this is a quite specific um, um, uh, typology which I think is, is, is interesting and this is to be finished soon and talking about the perspective and the different views, this rhomboid shape that is very regular and has a sort of a, st a strong and a very strict geometrical uh, logic in the, uh, to it, um, appears then with this sort of different views, embracing this, ah, it's a small, it's, it's a small um, train station and you would have then the, the, the square of the, of, the, of, the, of the train station just in front, so it's sort of embracing this, this um, arrival. So it's the... Uh -huh. No, no, this is uh, housing and offices. The train station is just in front. It's just in front. No, no, it is, let's say, modestly speaking, the Pirelli Tower of Pratteln. Uh, but Pratteln is not Milano, so I think it's okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. No, no, but... Uh, no? 
stacking floors and still giving a physiognomy to the building. I think this is also related to Pölzig again. Yeah. And another, another scheme I like extremely, I don't know, I, I have just now two images. Uh, 1925, um, the fair, a building for the fair in Hamburg that kind of grows up to this enormous curve towards the railway, uh, railway tracks. And on the other hand, it steps down in this sort of cubicle um, unit uh, that talks of a very simple principle. One type of opening, one formal principle. This is highly contemporary. That's a crazy, this is, you know, there is, this is a really crazy scheme. And it's not Bauhaus, it's not international style. It's dramatically modern and you could say still medieval in a, in a way. And, and therefore, um, uh, yeah, I just, I just, um, I'm happy to show you this image. And then of course, just to go on with my blurring game, I like to show you a sketch of a, of a comp uh, actually a project we won recently in Paris for housing. One, I mean, it's, you know, treating the volumes, uh, stepping down the volumes, very modest. Uh, it's a housing, one, one window, metal facade, sitting on a, on a workshop for the Metro. So this is a, a recent housing project. And since we had to do very beautiful images with greenery and, and plants and things uh, for the competition, I had the only image I can show here is a sketch from during the competition. So, um, because I think it shows the interest in form and, and the sculpture quality of the body. And then just to keep it even simpler and stronger and more independent from function at first sight. This, this office building we did a, uh, uh, four years ago, perhaps. Um, it's an office building, and what is interesting, it is just, in my understanding and the way it's represented here, it expresses a very simple architectural principle of the stacking of three floors or three slabs. So the fragile, dramatic fragility of, of the tectonics of these columns and then the massive on-site co uh, white concrete um, parapet of, of the horizontal. So in the end, when it doesn't matter whether it's this kind of modernistic, almost iconic building or another principle, that, that we come to the point where the project kind of gets its autonomy for, for um, just the structure itself, then I, think, then I think it's quite an achievement. And to link it back to my kind of instant improvisation of theory, you could say the monumentalization through simplification and repetition is a principle that I see in general, and I see it very well with Pölzig. Yeah? When you look at these at this, um, drawings where he starts from the Baroque movement, he comes to the urban buildings where one element, actually back in the 20s again, huh, he goes back to the arches of the, of the, of the early days, and he does this wonderful, um, um, actually, factory building that was built. I don't have a picture, but it's massive stone. Uh, it's a bit of kind of anachronistic. So nostalgia strikes back, but in this repetitive serial way and um, gives me another uh, sort of repetition in, in tectonics of floors, a project we didn't, we actually we didn't win that competition. So, and to come back to something that is really the most banal thing you can say in a, in a lecture on architecture, that to, start, to really dare to start to talk about symmetry, but I, I will do that because when I was thinking of these Pölzi projects, with a few exceptions, eh, they're all symmetrical, eh, which is not the case yet for ours, but it will come. Eh, and that's early, that's, that was the, that's the this town hall for, for Dresden, 1921, eh, symmetrical. And this is 27, a garden pavilion, a weekend house. It looks like a Tessino. Huh? This is Pölzig. Huh? <laughs> so again, when I was saying, avoiding a sort of a style, but it's beautiful. One space, kind of three niches where you would have a bed, one bench, a kitchen here, and that's it. Huh? It looks like... Tessino or Wachsmann even, eh? for the house, for, for Einstein at once. Beautiful, I find that fantastic. So it helps again eh? to rediscover Pölzig, because that's, that's an easy one, eh? very elegant. Mm. And I have a, such a box in a garden, 
where we did uh, even more easy, <laughs> maybe too easy object, which is just a box, it's symmetrical, two rooms, an entrance that is at the same time a kitchen, and a bathroom, and walls that are at the same time doors. So you would flip all that and you have one space, or you have six spaces, or uh, four spaces, or, um, cladded with roof felt. So, a sort of a kind of a, yeah, perhaps in a way familiar with the, with the Pulsic simplicity of the most modest program that then seduces you to become classicistic. Uh, this is interesting. When it gets really simple, then you refer perhaps to, to these uh, moments of, of uh, the greater order of classicism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, it was built for an old gentleman in his 90s to live there and to, to move out of the house that is in the, in the same garden, so he took his furniture. Okay, I'm actually on 56 minutes now, so I think an hour will be good. I hope this is fine with you. But I mean, Pelzig is not coming every day, so let's um, let's be let's be generous. Let's be generous. This is uh, the extension of the Reichstag, huh? also kind of euphoric times, 1929, perhaps just before the crash. Uh, extension to the Reichstag on the right, uh, on the right, and then it was this kind of huge development, and it's so simplistic. Huh? <laughs> How to make the connection or the transition from this form to that form? I don't know whether this is his best project. But somehow I was very fascinated by that plan, you know. And there is definitely a moment. The one of uh, Friedrichstrasse uh, just recycled. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Which was seven years earlier. So, so not built for different reasons. And, um, but in a way, quite something. Huh? And to Pelzig, you forgive it. You think it's okay. It's a kind of, honestly, huh, I think. And then he did a sort of a. Another proposal in a different place, Frankfurt, uh, IG Farben. The biggest complex he built, actually. Uh, it was um, for this um, huge company. Uh, I mean, this is corporate architecture, like in an American sort of scale. Uh, in the n late 1920s or 1930, it's in stone. It has these six or five however you want to count these kind of elements, monumental. No? In a way, I d I've never, actually it still exists, now it's Goethe in um, Universität. I never went to see it, I have to admit, so I don't know. From I don't like it so much. No? This is a beautiful image. What I like better, and I saw it, is the Haus des Rundfunks in Berlin. No? This is a beautiful building, no? this is an amazing building. And it's a bit, it's, um, 1930 as well. So, Pelzig died 36. At that, at that, so he's 61 years old. Mature work. There is still expressionism, but don't mis misunderstand expressionism as a sort of a stylish um, um, uh, epiteton. Huh? It is not. It is to express the deeper essence of the architectural artifact, the materiality, the way it's built, the way it's organized, perhaps. And it has a clarity and a strength which I just look up to, you know. And this is, um, so how's this Rundfunks, uh, broadcasting is a very interesting topic here and also in Lausanne, uh, how's this Rundfunks. Um, no. <laughs> so this was an early plan. I was talking about symmetry, so at some point he managed, that's the definite plan, with the different studio or concert halls where you would broadcast and uh, record and broadcast and then um, the, the offices around. That's the facade, hmm? and this is still there. You, you, might, uh, you, you must know it. This is um, a really beautiful building, also because it ha in a way it's monumental in the way it's conceived, but it's not so big. Huh? I think it's a kind of a very reasonable urban building with a beautiful courtyard, all in ceramics. Um, yeah, sort of exemplary work of late late Pelzig, and um, of course this. Since I'm not since I'm not shy, I, I just easily go back to another in my in my sort of slalom, and this is a project we're doing as well now. And this is the Kunstmuseum in Basel, and um, 
uh, just for the sake of the argument, I could say here I try to accumulate some of the characteristics of the of of my of, of my um, instant discourse on nostalgia hmm? of the brickwork of the ruin of autonomy of form, I think, and of course monumentality. It is not a big project. It's a museum extension in Basel, not very big, but in a way proud. It stands across the street from a very powerful, strong building that is the existing museum. So it's an extension to it and a sort of a, a pair relationship at eye level, but still this is much smaller and um, but has a kind of a significant um, physiognomy to that entrance and it is almost symmetrical. It tries to be symmetrical, but it's not. Uh, the image of the massive brick, I talked about that. I also talked about the reality of the nowadays construction means there is brick, it is a solid, even jointless, no dilatation, so it is a still authentic brick, but it of course stands in front of a concrete wall, so it's a double layered wall, but it, and that's mock-ups, that's different tests in colors and, and the way we would uh, put the masonry. But what is interesting, I mean, actually in terms of engineering, the brickwork we are building, or we already be partly built up here, is very innovative. No joints, elastic, sort of elastische Lagerung, eh? so it, it, is, um, it can move. It's a risky and interesting thing, eh? very innovative, at the same time extremely conservative. And that's what I call kind of conservative innovation, and I don't take it as a joke. Eh? I think we architects, and this links me back to Pelzig once more, we have the great privilege that many, many things that are historical, that date back, I don't know, centuries, are still valuable to us to a certain extent. I always make the comparison with medicine, you know. My wife is a medical researcher. I mean, it's not that interesting what they found out in the 1920s. It just doesn't count anymore. For us, it matters. And we have a way of sort of reanimating this knowledge, but we always have to translate it. And I dream of this solidity of politics building. How can I now still make it happen in, in, the, today's, in the today's conditions? I accept that as a challenge, and I don't think this is retro at all. I think this is very kind of a straightforwardness in architectural research related to the heritage, if you want. And this is the plan, huh? not really symmetrical, but you get the idea. And I show you some images, monumental stairs in the center, you got the plan. Huh? So it's almost 30 meters high in the end. Huh? So you would have between the two boxes of exhibitions, you would have this space and light from the top, and then you go back in, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's a bit of a mess, sorry. And then you see uh, inside the cubicles or the gallery spaces, you have then a very tectonic organization of space. On-site cast concrete walls with the prefab elements for the roof. So that's the top floor, where then the roof. This is an interesting moment during the base build period. So it gives you just an idea huh, about the almost archaic quality we try to give um, these spaces. And I think I'm quite confident at the moment that this will be, I think, a very valuable uh, place to exhibit art work, which of course was, was the, the high ambition also in relation to the existing one. So, and now I come to the very last one. And this is, I think, my favorite Pelzig project, 1916, House der Freundschaft, the House of Friendship, conceived for Constantinople, also for Istanbul at the time. There was a competition, and this is also in, that's a bit for the anecdote, but that's interesting. It was a competition held by the Deutsche Werkbund. They wanted to, actually, I don't know how come that they were thinking of a House der Freundschaft with, with Turkey. Um, uh, but, they invited 12 architects, also um, Max Taut, um, Schmidthenner, I think, as well, so some of these conservative guys and so, 12 in total. And the rules of the competition was 
that the competitors themselves they would judge the competition. Uh, this is uh, this is in a way strange, huh? this is, and I find that really interesting. Uh, we can take that on and, and discuss later. Anyway, he didn't win. Uh, it was a very sort of conventional drawing that that won. And also Taut, for instance, he did almost kind of a classicist thing with a bit of a kind of Islamic cupola. It was a rather embarrassing uh, proposal. And <laughs> and um, Pölzig did this. Uh, amazing. Uh, a sort of a step well that stands out of the city or a sort of a terraced house that grows up into the horizon. Uh, two courtyards, three, I don't know how to count. I mean, in terms of volume, this is perhaps a bit strange to see. Uh, very organized. It's a centre culturel. Huh? There, there, is, um, there is a cafe and then there is a courtyard and there is um, Kunstausstellung, so exhibition space, etc. Then you would have small and bigger um, halls for events, Kleiner Saal and, and the foyer and, and the wardrobes and then you have the Große Saal, so the, the big hall, uh, reception hall on the top with then these terraces in front overlooking the Bosporus. I mean it's so poetic, maybe nostalgic again, I don't know. That, that's the, the second top floor with the gallery around the, uh, the Saal and then you have the roof garden and this is the section. Uh, this is the section. And this is the facade. Simple. The typological structure of the building is so clear that all its formal richness and its language derive from that and I think um, it's it's a project I would wish to see built nowadays huh? and therefore this makes Pölzig um, to me very actual and uh, very contemporary again. Uh, so this is the last image, I don't count this one but um, <laughs> it's on the friendship, it's on the friendship I dedicate this house of friendship to my friendship with his work. Uh, let's 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 remain modest. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.